Hello and welcome to Pitboards and Podiums with me, Maya Westwick. In today's episode, we are going to be talking all about the current world champion, Max Verstappen. So buckle up and let's talk F1. All right, guys. So as I said, today we are talking all about Max Verstappen. So Max Verstappen is a three-time world champion in Formula One. He currently drives for Red Bull Racing. He won the championships in 2021, which was controversial, 2022 and 2023. And he was born on the 30th of September, 1997. So that makes him 26 years old and a Libra. He was born in Belgium, but he does race under the Dutch flag, making him the first ever Dutch Formula One world champion. And his father was the Dutch Formula One driver, Jos Verstappen, who I'm not really gonna, I'm not gonna get into that today. I'm not gonna get into it. He was very harsh towards him during his childhood. Um, And also, I mean, he's just a questionable character anyway. He's got a litany of charges against him legally for various crimes and allegations of abuse and all of that sort of thing. I think there's an attempted murder charge on there. Don't quote me to that could be wrong it's all I'm gonna say it's all alleged some of it's not alleged but I'm gonna say it's all alleged so that I cannot get caught up in anything um I'm not gonna go into detail on it but Max himself has trauma dumped many times without even realizing that he's trauma dumping I think he'll just be like oh yeah my dad once stabbed a mechanic and everyone around him is just like what do you mean what do you mean so just Google it. Just search for videos of Max trauma dumping and you'll find whole compilations of it really easily. Anyway, Max became the youngest driver to compete in Formula One on his debut at the 2015 Australian Grand Prix when he was 17 years and 166 days old. So like, he was 17 and a half, not even that. And he was a Formula One driver. Madness. His race number is the number 33, but at the moment you'll see him using the number one because of him being the reigning world champion. So since 2022, the year after his first championship, he has used the number one. So he will be using the number one again this year because he won last year's championship. But of course, if he does not win the championship this year, he cannot use it in 2025. So far in his career, he has won 54 races. He's got 98 podiums. 2,586.5 2,586.5 points, 32 poles, 30 fastest laps, and that is in 185 race starts, which is quite impressive. But I think considering how young he is, it's very easy for us to forget that he's literally been in Formula One for like eight years. Like he is already a good chunk of his career into Formula One and he's 26 which is slightly mad. Max also holds many, many, many records in Formula One. So obviously he's got quite a lot of youngest driver to do something records. So he's got youngest driver to score points at 17 years and 180 days at the 2015 Malaysian Grand Prix. Youngest driver to win 18 years, 228 days at the 2016 Spanish Grand Prix. Youngest driver to finish on the podium again at the 2016 Spanish Grand Prix. Youngest driver to lead a lap again at the 2016 Spanish Grand Prix. Youngest driver to set fastest lap at the 2016 Brazilian Grand Prix at 19 years and 44 days. Youngest driver to score a Grand Slam at 23 years, 277 days at the 2021 Austrian Grand Prix. And then he's got lots and lots of other records as well, which I will go into now. So he's got most wins in a season, which was from last season. He won 19 races last year. He's got the most consecutive wins at 10, which was from Miami 2023 to Italy 2023. He's got most wins in a calendar month, which is four shared with Sir Lewis Hamilton for July last year. Most wins before his first pole position, which is seven, which he shares with Sir Jackie Stewart. Most wins from pole in a single season, which is 12 from last year. Highest percentage of wins in a season, again from last year, 86.36% of the entire season he won, which is mad, absolute madness. He's also got the most wins not from pole position in a season, which was nine in 2022. Got the most consecutive wins from pole, which is 16 from the 2022 Dutch Grand Prix to the 2023 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Most wins from different grid slots, which is nine shared with Fernando Alonso. So that's nine different starting positions that he's then gone on to win the race. Most wins from different grid slots in a single season, which is seven. Most sprint wins in a season, which is four last year. Most podium finishes in a season, which is 21 last year. Most consecutive top two finishes, which is 15 shared with Michael Schumacher and his 
record of that 15 goes from 2022 Abu Dhabi to 2023 Italy. Most points in a season, which is 575 from last year. Highest percentage of points in a season, 92.7. He's got 92.7% of like the total points that he could have got in 2023. Highest average points per race started in his entire career, 13.98. Highest average points per race started in a single season in 2023 was 26.14. So his highest average, like his average points per race last year was higher than the actual amount of points you can get each race because of the sprint weekends as well. Like, in a standard race weekend, the maximum amount of points you can ever get is 26. And his average is higher than that because of the sprint weekends. Ridiculous. Most points between first and second in the World Championship, which again was last year. He, in first, obviously had 575 points. And then he had a gap down to Sergio Perez in P2 of 290 points. Almost 300 points between first and second. Highest percentage points difference between first and second, again last year, 50.43%. Most laps led in a single season, 1,003 last year. Highest percentage of laps led in a single season, 75.7%, again last year. Most races led in a season, last year, again, a lot of these records are last year, 20. Most hat-tricks in a season, 6 last year. Most overtakes in a season, 78 overtakes in 2016. So that was when he wasn't in a car that was a rocket ship and, you know, qualifying on pole and just running away from the field. He actually had to go through people to get up to the top. Most consecutive races as championship leader, which is 39 from the 2022 Spanish Grand Prix all the way to the 2023 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, so the end of last season. That record is still ongoing, obviously depending on if he wins the first race of the new season or not. If he doesn't win in Bahrain, then his record will be 23. If he does, his record will carry on going until he's no longer championship leader. And most races left in a season when becoming world champion at six, which again, he set last year and he does share that record with Michael Schumacher, who holds it for the 2002 season. So Max's junior career started in 2005 when he started karting professionally. He won the VAS championship and finished second in the Limburg's kart championship, both of which are in like the mini junior category of karting. And then he also that year finished 16th in the Dutch NAB championship. And then in 2006, he competed in the VAS championship again again in the mini junior category and won that championship. In 2007, he won the Dutch championship and the Rotax Max Challenge Belgium in the mini max category. And he also finished 35th in the Chrono Dutch Rotax Max Challenge. In 2008, he then won the Belgian championship in the cadet class of karting and also the Rotax Max Challenge Belgium and the BNL karting series in the mini max class. In 2009, he then again won both the Rotax Max Challenge Belgium and the BNL Karting Series in the Mini Max class, and he also won the Belgian Championship in the KF5 class of karting. In 2010, he then moves up to KF3, winning the WSK Euro Series, Bridgestone Cup European Final, WSK World Series, and the WSK Nations Cup. He came second in the South Garda Winter Cup and second in the CAK FIA World Cup, which he was behind Alex Albon in. Alex Albon won that year. And he was also fifth in the CAK FIA European Championship. In 2011, he won the WSK Euro Series and came second in the South Garda Winter Cup before moving up to KF2 for 2012. He also competed partially in KZ2 and KF1, but like, predominantly in KF2. So he won the South Garda Winter Cup and the WSK Master Series and then came second in the CIK FIA World Cup in KF2. He didn't finish the CIK FIA World Cup in the KZ2 class and he came eighth in it in the KF1 class. So he competed in the same championship of karting in multiple different categories. So it's a lot of competition. It's a lot of of karting to be doing. Like it takes up a lot of time. In 2013, he won the South Garda Winter Cup in KF2. He finished 32nd in the Rotax Max Euro Challenge senior section of it. He won the WSK Euro Series in KZ1 and the WSK Master Series in KZ2. He also won the WSK FIA European Championship and finished third in the WSK FIA World Championship in KF class. And he also won the CIK FIA European Championship and World Championship in the KZ class. So like the two highest 
classes of, of karting there. In 2014, he then competed in the inaugural and only Florida Winter Series, winning two races, three poles, three fastest laps, and five podiums in 12 races. He competed in FIA European Formula 3, and also the Macau Grand Prix with Van Amersfoort Racing, finishing the F3 season with 10 wins, seven poles, seven fastest laps, and 16 podiums, coming third in the championship. And he finished the Macau Grand Prix seventh with fastest lap. He won the Zandvoort Masters with Motor Park from pole, and he became the youngest driver to participate in a Formula One Grand Prix weekend at 17 years and three days old, driving in free practice one at the Japanese Grand Prix with Toro Rosso, which he then also did at the US Grand Prix and Brazilian Grand Prix. In 2014, he also received the NOC NSF Young Talent Award and the FIA Action of the Year Award. And then in 2015, he joined Formula One with Scuderia Toro Rosso, partnering Carlos Sainz. He scored points in his second ever race at Malaysia, finishing P7, which made him the youngest driver to score points in Formula One. His best finish of the season was P4 at the Hungarian and the US Grand Prix. And he retired from the Australian, Bahrain, Monaco and British Grand Prix. Notably, his debut race in Australia was due to an engine failure which obviously is not ideal it's your first ever race in formula one and you can't even finish it because your car breaks um and at monaco he was involved in a high speed collision with roman grosjean he like clipped the back of grosjean's car going into turn one sandavot and crashed into the barriers at high speed he received a five place penalty for that for the next race and felipe massa started saying that he thought he was a dangerous driver. He finished his debut season in Formula 1 12th in the championship with 49 points and received Rookie of the Year, Personality of the Year and Action of the Year awards at the FIA prize giving gala. In 2016, he drove the first four races of the season with Toro Rosso before being promoted up to Red Bull Racing alongside Daniel Ricciardo from the Spanish Grand Prix onwards. He replaced Daniel Kvyat who was demoted down to Toro Rosso. He made contact with Sainz while he was still driving for Toro Rosso in Australia, the season opener, while being frustrated that he was behind him in the race. He was saying on his team radio that he was faster than him and he wanted to get past him. He was getting annoyed that he wasn't getting past him. So in an attempt to overtake him, they made contact. Eventually, he finished the race 10th, one second behind Sainz in 9th. He retired from the Russian Grand Prix, which was his last race with Toro Rosso. Um, and also the Monaco Grand Prix and the US Grand Prix. He achieved his first podium and first win in Formula One at the Spanish Grand Prix, his first race with Red Bull. And that was because he took advantage of the Mercedes drivers taking each other out and that made him the youngest driver to win a Formula One race. He was criticized for his aggressive driving style. Um, This was kind of a feature of his first few years in Formula One, especially he was given a quote gentle warning by Formula One director Charlie Whiting over his aggression on track but despite that there was still a lot of concerns about his aggressive driving style and how it had continued so in October the FIA disallowed moving under braking to stop Verstappen driving so dangerously um there was a couple of notable incidents throughout the season so at the Belgian Grand Prix he collided with Kimi Raikkonen at the first corner he then pushed Vettel Raikkonen and Perez wide at Lake Home and aggressively blocked Raikkonen on the Kemmel Strait. Raikkonen then commented that Verstappen was going to cause a huge accident sooner or later. And then at the Brazilian Grand Prix, he made a very impressive charge up from pretty much the back of the field up to the podium. Sebastian Vettel felt that he'd been pushed off track by Verstappen. The stewards didn't agree. The stewards kind of deemed it absolutely fine. They said that there was nothing that needed investigating didn't take any action on it but he kind of ruffled a lot of feathers with a lot of drivers um he scored seven podiums that year in spain austria britain germany malaysia japan and brazil he also got the fastest lap in brazil and finished the season fifth in the championship with 204 points and he received the fia action of the year award FIA Personality of the Year Award, Lorenzo Bandini Trophy and Dutch Sportsman of the Year. In 2017, he won two races in Malaysia and in Mexico and got a fastest lap in Brazil. He got four podiums, so obviously Malaysia and Mexico and also China and Japan. And he suffered seven retirements in the first 14 races of the year. Four of which were due to mechanical issues and then the other three were first lap collisions in Spain, Austria and Singapore. By this time, he had developed quite a reputation for dangerous 
and sometimes dirty driving um and he was kind of starting to be referred to as crash stappen by the media and by the public obviously not really the reputation that you want to have in formula one he finished the season sixth in the championship with 168 points and received the fia personality of the year award in 2018 he had a very very eventful controversial season he won two races in Austria and in Mexico, and he got two fastest laps in Monaco and Canada. He had 11 podiums, so obviously his two wins, Austria and Mexico, but also Spain, Canada, France, Belgium, Singapore, Japan, America, Brazil, and Abu Dhabi. And, but it was, as I've said, it was eventful and it was controversial. So in Australia, he fell behind Magnussen at the start um, because he just didn't get a very good start off the line. And he made several reckless attempts to regain his position. And then he eventually kind of, he ran wide multiple times. He damaged his car and eventually he span and then it caused him to lose even more positions that he then had to try and recover from if he, whereas if he'd just like waited and not been reckless in trying to pass Magnussen, he probably would have got past him. Um, The next race in Bahrain, he crashed in qualifying and then he had to make his way through the field from 15th. And in an attempt to pass the reigning world champion, Sir Lewis Hamilton, at the start of lap two, he collided with him and suffered a puncture that ultimately forced him to have to retire from the race with suspension damage. And then at the next race in China, so this is like three on the bounce, at the next race in China, in an attempt to overtake the then championship leader for P3 in the race, Sebastian Vettel, um, he collided with him and received a 10 second penalty for that. Then in Azerbaijan, after a race-long battle with Ricardo for P4, so his teammate, Daniel Ricardo, Ricardo ran into the back of Verstappen during an overtaking attempt that Verstappen had quite aggressively defended. There was a lot of arguments over whether he had moved under braking, which obviously is not allowed anymore because of his dangerous driving. And that caused both of the Red Bulls to have to retire from the race. They were both reprimanded from the stewards and blamed by the team. And it was quite controversial within Red Bull. It's one of the kind of catalyst moments for Daniel Ricciardo choosing to leave the team. He did achieve his first podium of the year in Spain, despite running into the back of Lance Stroll under the virtual safety car and causing some minor front wing damage, but he still managed to finish on the podium. And then in Monaco, he crashed during free practice three and the team weren't able to fix the car in time for qualifying. So that meant they had to start the race with special permission from the stewards from the back of the grid. That weekend, Christian Horner, the Red Bull team principal, said that Max needed to stop making these mistakes and suggested that he could learn from Daniel Ricciardo. And Helmut Marco said that Max was too impatient. So they're starting to get a little bit annoyed at all of the the damages that's going on. At the British Grand Prix at Silverstone, he did not have a great weekend. He had a gearbox problem in practice one, he crashed out of practice two, and then he retired from the race with brake problems. Not a good weekend for him. He retired from the Hungarian Grand Prix with an engine failure, and he collided with Esteban Ocon. From the lead of the Brazilian Grand Prix, This was a very, very spicy, very controversial moment. So Ocon was a lap down, but he had pitted and he was on fresh tyres and he was trying to unlap himself and get back past Verstappen to then, you know, carry on round and try and overtake some people that he was actually racing. The collision with Ocon was blamed on Ocon. The stewards thought it was his fault. Ocon received a 10 second stop go penalty for that incident. So that's literally like the longest kind of penalty that you can get during a race. After the race, in the pits, Verstappen decided to confront Ocon, um, shouting at him and pushing him. So he did get physical with his confrontation. Um, Obviously, we've seen it with people before. We've seen it with Michael Schumacher before. We've seen it with drivers doing that before. Doesn't mean it's okay. And he was given two days of public service as a penalty by the FIA, whatever that means. Kind of feels a bit like a slap on the wrist, but it is what it is. And he finished the season fourth in the championship with 249 points. In 2019, he was teammated with Pierre Gasly after Daniel Ricciardo had left Red Bull until the Belgian Grand Prix. And then from then onwards, he was with Alex Albon because of Red Bull swapping around their drivers like that with um, Toro Rosso. He won three races in Austria, Germany and Brazil. Austria was controversial um, as he had made contact with Leclerc and pushed him off track to take the lead but then the pass was deemed legal by the stewards and he was allowed to keep his race win, but there was just a lot of controversy about that being allowed. The Hungarian Grand Prix is where he took his first ever pole position in the sport, becoming the first Dutch Formula One driver 
to be a pole sitter and also the 100th pole sitter in Formula One and then he took his second pole position in Brazil. He retired from both Belgium and Japan and he got three fastest laps in Austria, Germany and Hungary and nine podiums. So we had Australia, Spain, Austria, Germany, Hungary, Singapore, America, Brazil and Abu Dhabi. He finished the season third in the championship with 278 points and received the FIA Action of the Year award. In 2020, he won two races. He won the 70th anniversary Grand Prix at Silverstone and the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. He also had pole at the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. He got three fastest laps in Britain, Eiffel and Bahrain and 11 podiums. So at the Styrian Grand Prix, Hungarian, British, 70th anniversary, Spanish, Belgian, Russian, Eiffel, Portuguese, Bahrain and Abu Dhabi. He retired from the Austrian Grand Prix with an electronic issue within the power unit. The Italian and the Tuscan Grand Prix and also the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix due to the spin caused by a sudden puncture. So Italy was not a good country for him in 2020. And during free practice for the Portuguese Grand Prix, he came under quite a a bit of fire, rightly so, because he made some quite nasty comments. He made some obliest comments and used slurs on his team radio against Lance Stroll, um, using the R word slur, and the slur, I'm, I'm obviously I'm not going to say these words, so the slur derived from the word um, used in the past to offensively refer to people with Down syndrome and also the indigenous peoples of like East Asia, Southeast Asia and the Arctic regions of North America, like Alaska and Arctic regions of Canada and all of that. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say the words myself, obviously, but the Mongolian government asked for an apology for his comments and also urged the FAA to take action on the comments that he made, but no official action was taken. Um, Verstappen admitted that the words he used, that's my cat's tail, if you can see that, I'm sorry. Verstappen admitted that the words he used were not correct, like quote, not correct. And Horner said that he hadn't meant to cause any offense and that he was dealt with internally, which again is kind of just a bit of a slap on the wrist, like, it's not okay. He finished the 2020 season third in the championship with 214 points, and then we had 2021, his first title. So his teammate this year was Sergio Perez. He became the first Dutch F1 driver to lead the world championship after winning the Monaco Grand Prix. He won 10 races, the Emilia-Romagna, Monaco, France, Styria, Austria, Belgium, Netherlands, US, Mexico and Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Obviously for Belgium, he only got half points because of it not being a race. And, you know, that was controversial in and of itself. And obviously the rules have changed on that now, which I did speak about in one of my recent F1 for Beginners episodes. He got 10 pole positions in Bahrain, France, Styria, Austria, Britain, Belgium, Netherlands, Italy, US and Abu Dhabi and six fastest laps in Spain, Azerbaijan, France, Austria, Qatar, and Abu Dhabi. He had 18 podiums, so he scored a podium everywhere, but Azerbaijan, where he didn't finish the race, but he was classified as 18th because he completed over 75% of the race distance. Britain, due to his crash with Sir Lewis Hamilton at Cops Corner. Hungary, due to Bottas being a bowling ball at the race start. And Italy, at Monza when he parked his car on top of Sir Lewis Hamilton's head. Yes, I'm going to say that because he did. And he even said, that's what you get. So he also, this was the first season with sprint races in Formula One. He came first in Britain, second at Monza and second at Sao Paulo sprint race. And he won the world championship with 395.5 points to Lewis Hamilton's 387.5 after the very, very controversial Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. I'm not going to talk about it all again now. I've spoken about it before. I spoke about it in the Hamilton episode. But, you know, they went into the final race of the season equal on points. He did drive an incredible season. He deserved to have won the championship. I just don't think he deserved to have won that race. So, realistically, Lewis should have been eight-time world champion, in my opinion. But, don't come for me, I'm not the only person who thinks it, and it didn't happen, so that's fine. It is what it is. He received the Dutch Sportsman of the Year and Autosport International Racing Driver of the Year awards that year, and then in 2022, he signed a five-year extension with Red Bull to the end of the 2028 season in Formula One. He retired from the Bahrain and Australian Grand Prix with fuel system issues, 
and then from then onwards had a very very dominant season in the sport he won 15 races he won saudi arabia emilia romagna miami spain azerbaijan canada france hungary belgium netherlands italy japan us mexico and abu dhabi he got seven pole positions at emilia romagna canada austria netherlands japan mexico and abu dhabi five fastest laps in Emilia Romagna, Miami, Australia, Belgium and the Netherlands, 17 podiums, so everywhere apart from Bahrain where he didn't finish but was classified 19th because he'd completed more than 75% of the race, Austria where he didn't finish, Britain where he was 7th, Singapore where he was 7th and Sao Paulo where he was 6th, he in the sprint races was 1st in Imola, 1st in Austria, 4th at Sao Paulo and he won the championship with 454 points, he had had competition from Leclerc in the Ferrari at the start of the season but a combination of Ferrari strategy just being Ferrari strategy and mechanical errors and like Leclerc driver errors quickly just allowed Verstappen to run away with the season basically and he also that year won the Dutch Sportsman of the Year, Autosport International Racing Driver of the Year, Laureus World Sports Award for Sportsman of the Year and Officer of the Order of Orange Nassau. Last season Verstappen and Red Bull dominated the sport entirely so this is going to be quite fast for me to go over what happened here because I'm, I'm yeah domination. He won 19 races, so he won every single race apart from Saudi Arabia where he came second, Azerbaijan where he came second and Singapore where he came fifth. He got 12 pole positions which were Bahrain, Australia, Monaco, Spain, Canada, Austria, Britain, Netherlands, Japan, Qatar, Sao Paulo and Abu Dhabi. He got nine fastest laps which was Saudi Arabia, Miami, Spain, Austria, Britain, Hungary, Japan, Qatar, Abu Dhabi. 21 podiums, so every single race apart from Singapore. At the sprint races, he was third in Azerbaijan, first in Austria, first at Belgium, second at Qatar, first in US and first in Sao Paulo. So he won four sprint races, which means he holds the record for it because obviously this was the first season with more than three races anyway. He won the championship after an incredibly, incredibly dominant season with 575 points. And as I reeled off to you earlier, a large amount of his records in Formula One were set in the 2023 season. He also received the Autosport International Racing Driver of the Year Awards, and he just had a very, very, very dominant season in Formula One. And that was, I don't want to say most deserving, that's not what I'm meaning, but that was his, that was his championship that you couldn't really argue with. Because obviously 2021 was tainted by Abu Dhabi, 2022 was tainted by Red Bull and the cost cap, 2023 was a year where Max could really come into his own and just show his skill and his ability and his domination. Obviously having such a good car helps, but he was able to show that he is a very, very good driver without that kind of being hindered a little bit or just tarnished a little bit by things that weren't really in his control you know like the last thing you want is for your record as a champion in the sport to be tainted by other people's decisions like Abu Dhabi wasn't his decision Red Bull spending too much money wasn't his decision so this is like the first year that he's been able to show that he doesn't need this like help obviously he doesn't need the help but there's always been a like an asterisk above it like well you know so he was kind of able to show people, actually, no, I can dominate the entire sport and set all of these records and I don't need people to help me do that. So good for him. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see who is able to challenge Red Bull in the next in the upcoming season in 2024. I think obviously with the news of Sir Lewis Hamilton moving to Ferrari for 2025, with Ferrari having Hamilton and Leclerc, are they going to be able to to challenge Red Bull, who knows, obviously 2026 we've got new regulations, who's going to be on top in that era of Formula 1, I think it's a very exciting time at the moment in Formula 1 to kind of really see what the competition is, I am hoping for a slightly more interesting season than 2023 because the Red Bull domination just was a little bit boring, I can't lie, like it's great to see them do well, absolutely great to see them do well, but just spice it up a bit you know what I mean just spice it up and it's the same with every like dominant era in Formula One sometimes you just need to spice it up a bit but that is what it is I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode if you did please let me know you know like rate comment subscribe share the podcast I would really really appreciate that and I will be back very soon I've got an episode on Sergio Perez coming up and I'm also instead of doing F1 for beginners this week I am going to be talking 
all about the Hamilton to Ferrari news because there's so much tea. There is so much tea about it and I just want to talk about all of it. So I will be this week. I hope you all have a beautiful rest of your day, week, life, you know, have a fabulous time and I'll see you again very, very soon. Bye!